Security is related, but we're, we're here talking fraud and uh, for those of you who were with us on Thursday, uh, apparently we got, uh, somebody nailed us with YouTube, uh, which we weren't expecting, which is why we're doing the mics today, because it was a little quiet on YouTube. Um, so there is a $400,000 telecom fraud yikes. Uh, Tom did a post of it, and it's uh, both the blog post and the YouTube are his. Um, so this time we're actually getting officially recorded and sound, so it'll be a little better when it gets onto the web. Um, we had a lot of people who actually were willing to say, yes, I have been defrauded or my customer has been defrauded. So we want to continue with that and the what can be done in each case to make it better or prevent it. Because uh, as we discussed, um, there isn't a whole lot you can put into Asterix itself that is going to prevent fraud. Okay, you have to fix the procedures, the methodology, what you do and set things properly, passwords, et cetera. But the reality is, is nine times out of 10, it's the human element that's the problem, not the switch. So we want to talk about how we can do this and how you can set up procedures and deal with it a little better um, and kind of cover this because it's not all going to be things that firewalls or other things and port blocking will handle. So, so out of the crowd that we currently have here, who was here on Tuesday for the first session? No, let's do this the other way. Who wasn't here Tuesday? Was it's a here? smaller list. Actually, bigger list. Okay. Okay. So, um, here's the same question that went out on Tuesday. First question, who got hit ever by fraud? Okay. F first one who's willing to come up and tell his story. Okay. Uh, Tim is we a have, brave man. We have a victim. No, it, it's, it's not a huge story, but... It, it's, uh, it's, it's a crazy one. Oops, sorry. It's a crazy, crazy one. Good. Like yeah, crazy. no, it's a crazy one. We had a um, we had a click to call service, and um, one of the options was that you could type in the phone number you wanted to call back. And we did, and I, maybe I'll talk some more about how we did this. But we we did checking on whether the number you called back was going to be expensive, and we limited it. We set a limit to like, I think it was twenty cents a minute. We wouldn't call back any number that turned up in the um, in the rate card for more than 20 cents a minute. So we, we kind of capped the thing there. And we thought, so that'll be fine. And um, I came in one morning and I had 30 voicemails of an hour. And I thought, what? So I listened to them and they were CNN. And I thought, what is going on here? And then I looked at the billing from my ITSP and each of these calls had been to a mobile phone provider in, now where was it? Somewhere in Eastern Europe who I turned, found later were running one of these processes where you get credit for incoming calls. You get like, for every minute, you get a second of incoming call. So these guys had sat there all night holding phones up to CNN, because otherwise the voicemail would have stopped, calling our voicemail system, or getting our voicemail system through the click to call to call them. And uh, so they ran up, you know, 40 hours. So they got a total credit of, I don't know what it was, probably 20 minutes or something for all this work. But I was out a couple of hundred quid. So, you know, the, what I learned from that is the sheer amount of pe effort people will go to to earn very small amounts of money. And it's disproportionate the amount of money that it costs you that you lose. Um, and the, the rate card thing is worth doing. I, it's actually not as hard as it looks to import the rate card from your ITSP, stick it in a database, and then for every call you make, look up how much it's going to cost you. And if it's above your threshold, simply don't make it. Um, it's like three lines of SQL, and you can put that in FunkoDBC, and it's a really simple test, and it's like at the last minute. And if the ITSP does charge you more, you go back and say, listen, it's not in your rate card. I looked it up before I called it. But the question is here, was you, were you able to do anything afterwards yeah. to actually block it? To say something, hey. Yeah, I explicitly blocked that number range. Ah. You well. didn't set a, a setting on voicemails over, uh, oh, yeah, no, over I, an I, hour. Um, no, I also turned the voicemail down to 10 minutes. But they came back and did a lot of them. Well, the, the, some of our customers wanted to have um, it was a general setting, so a number of the customers wanted to be able to leave messages about, you know, I hey, my hotel room is, is rubbish, we want, you know, we want to be moved and go to the customer service agent. So they needed to be kind of not very short. Um, but uh, so there's a threshold where it's too much hassle to do. So yeah, no, the, the, the recovery thing was to block that number range because I didn't have any customers in that space, was to shorten the, the, um, 
the, the, and, and also to tighten up the, the silence detection. I mean, the reason they'd used CNN was because otherwise the voicemail would have stopped as soon as it was silent. Um, I shortened that as an extra piece of paranoia. So there you go. That's my story. Okay. I just have a quick comment on that. Um, I hang out at the Astro Sky RC channel, you know, try to help people increase your karma, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, geez, maybe three or four times I've run into people trying to use Astros to do this exact fraud scheme. And uh, it's, it's interesting. You get to a point where they're just like, well, I just don't understand. This is what I kind of want to do. And, and uh, you kind of got to listen to a little bit more. Like, well, it kind of sounds fraudy. You can say, hey, this is fraud. I'm not going to help you. They usually say, no, it's not fraud. Uh, but if you want some money, and maybe you could work with me a little. <laughs> so be careful. When you guys are helping people out, you might be helping someone uh, establish a base of fraud. Well, th this is one of the things we, we started to cover in some of the other sessions. The people who are now committing fraud are not teenagers looking for kicks or having fun. These are people who are looking to make real financial gains. And uh, the one in Romania was $1.6 million over a year that they got by playing these kinds of games. And frequently they will find somebody like you guys who are legitimate, serious, trying to do something right, and they will trick you into doing something that will then get exploited in a way that you don't know. They can afford to hire as good programmers or better than anybody else uh, on the market because they don't care. Uh, so it's something that you have to be very careful about. Um, here's an interesting story in direct relation to what uh, Tim actually told us. Um, the original, when Humbug was initially conceived, uh, it all started out from a small Jaja type operation that I, I was part of. And we had big problems with fraud and nobody could help us. Fraud platforms since the video were like half a million dollars. It just didn't make any sense. Uh, one of the incidents we found was that we would see calls running from China to Taiwan for four hours. Now, on a general scale, China landline is what? One cent a minute? Something else, cent and a half? Taiwan landline, what is that? A cent and a half? No big deal there. There's no real risk, even if it racks up to 10,000 minutes. So it'll be what? $100? No big deal. But we, we were seeing a lot of these calls and we were like saying, okay, what's going on? Why do we have the same numbers calling, the same person calling Taiwan and calling China four times, six times consecutive, one after the other? Each call is roughly three hours, four hours long. It was really weird for us. So we started eavesdropping on the calls. Yes, it's not nice. But when somebody does something which seems to be illegal, you have all the rights in the world to do that. Because somebody is stealing money from you. You're being defrauded. So we ended up realizing that these were actually two different call shops, one in China and one in Taiwan, selling these calls for half a dollar per minute. So they were using our service to get it for free, and they were selling it to somebody else. It was pretty funny. <clears throat> Um, another thing is that when you think about fraud is that most people, as I said on uh, Tuesday, um, just repeating something for people who weren't here, most people think about voice over IP security and telephony security as, hey, we'll put a firewall in at most, we'll add some rules, some billing, some this, some that. Yes, these are all good measures, but they're not the solution. The end of the solution is you have to, it's a constant fight, it's just like, like an antivirus. Why do you app update your antivirus on a daily basis? Because every day there are new viruses out there. There are new attacks. There are new means of exploiting you. So you have to protect yourself. It's exactly the same thing. Um, taking what Tim said also on that same thing, rate lists change very rapidly. You can't download it once and assume that it's going to protect you. You have to keep getting the rate list if you're going to use what he was suggesting. You have to download it regularly because Every time a new MVNO comes in and changes the rules and the rates and stuff, you're now open again. And that happens every other day. You'll get dozens of them created and disappearing. So uh, one, one of my ITSPs, I think they stopped doing this, but actually had a REST API that you could do an HTTP post to of the number you're going to call. And you would get back a little piece of JSON which said what the rate was going to be and actually which country it was going to. And I thought that, that was fairly accurate. Did that, and I think that service is still there. They never made a big thing about it, but it was there, and I actually put it in the dark map. So for them, I had the current rate. That, 
That's fair. If they had the current rate, because yeah. <laughs> what, the, what the dozen of MVNOs created in the UK in, in two days may not have updated their operators to update your ITSP. But at that point, it's their problem. Yeah. They advertise that line at that, right. that call at that rate. As far as I'm concerned, that's yeah. their problem, not mine. More. But it's still fraud. Anybody else? Oh, yeah. yeah, I've got a couple. Of them. You've got Sorry. a couple. Yeah, yeah, Choose yeah. your best. Choose your weirdest. The one that makes that will make everybody here groan. Fall, groan. No, fall on the floor, laughing like crazy. Okay, well, one second. Please understand. After we finished the session on Tuesday in the evening, one of the guys walked up to us and literally get, went up to Nir and said, "You scared the shit out of me." He hadn't realized how big the kinds of problems and how simple some of the attacks were that were out there, and now he's worried about what's going on and worried about how to fix it, which is part of why we keep talking about other sessions here about fraud and security and what you can do. Yeah, in, uh, in, a, oh, it's on. Yeah, in a previous life, uh, I ran a, an ITSP called GossipTel, and we used to uh, give away loads and loads of free calls to 34 countries. Uh, and a number of people started to take advantage of that. Um, and um, well, I'll tell you the one we caught first. So there was a, one guy who was uh, clearly running a, a chain of call shops off the back of this, uh, based in Jordan. Um, and he was routing all of his stuff through an SBC with a router. Um, he wasn't very good at hiding his trails. So, uh, and unfortunately for him, he left his router passwords as default. <laughs> and so we that, got in there and made a few modifications, like uh, 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 we, I loaded something like 23 copies of Tom Jones singing What's New Pussycat into his, <laughs> his uh, spare space. So uh, his, uh, his router performance was severely degraded. You rickrolled him. Yeah, I did, yeah. <laughs> Um, but the way we, we dealt with it... We're that, mean. We're very mean. Uh, we, we put in an, a, an acceptable uh, usage policy of something like uh, 10,000 minutes a month or a week or whatever it was. And, we, and our policy then was that when you hit that a AUP, the next call you make, instead of going out to the PSDN, we go to a customer services rep, uh, and they were prepared. They had 10 questions based upon terms and conditions. And uh, the... the the, uh, the caller had to answer these 10 questions. And if you get any of them wrong, it was thuk donk, you're terminated under the terms, of, the terms of conditions. And in the time that we did it, we only ever had one person who was a, a guy from Sri Lanka, got through, answered all the questions correctly. Uh, apparently, he had a very big family, uh, all <laughs> living in the house with him. Uh, and he was so good, we actually offered him a job at the end of it. So, <laughs> so you'd like to know that. Yeah, that that yeah. can happen a lot. You want your sweets? Yeah. Okay, next case. We want uh, something juicy. You read something? That was a comment to rate plans. Um, and I'll make this quick. But a good sister to knowing what your rates are, how much you're spending it on, how much you're selling it for, et cetera, is to know where not to call. That's where these guys come in. Um, and another uh, good sister to that is having a good numbering plan uh, provider. Uh, we use one. I, I actually don't remember the website off the top of my head. But uh, it's, it's simple enough to uh, only allow mobile and fixed uh, uh, numbers. Uh, completely ignore <coughs> satellite, completely ignore everything else until the client complains says, hey, we need this turned on. And you're like, boop, okay, you're good to go. Uh, they, won't, they won't complain after that point, but you also save them and yourself a lot of money uh, due to fraud, due to, due to everything else that you might not be able to anticipate. So, uh, try to try to use those as well if you can. You have the rates. You know how much they cost, but you you don't. You say, hey, no one's ever going to call it. Fifteen bucks a minute. Yeah, you can whitelist things that way, and in some cases, if it's uh, areas that you're worried about. You can actually say, this is a risk. Please sign that you want it turned on before I turn it on because we don't want the liability. Um, that one's worth it. Oh, there you go. I didn't have a problem. It's okay. <laughs> we're, we're here looking for solutions, so it's a little of both. Okay. More. Come on. we got to have some juicy stuff here. We've oh. got, like, what, 50 people in the crowd? J just summarizing some of what we've heard. Changing from the default passwords. Biggest problem people find yeah. is you keep the default password, and everybody knows once they figure out what your box is, what that default is, and they will try it. Um, how many of you have seen Spaceballs? 
<laughs> okay. One, two, three, four. Okay. Amazing. This is very common kinds of things. The most common passwords on voice mailboxes, which allow frequently dial through, which is another thing that you really have to decide. Do you really want to give all of your extensions? Okay. One, two, three, four. One, 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 one. The actual four digit extension number are the three most common passwords that people use because they're easy to remember. They're also easy to hack. Okay. Uh, and, and we keep saying this. Do you need a voice mailbox in the conference room, in the copy room, in the server room, in the lobby. Somebody's been let go. Why do you still have the voice mailbox active so somebody can hack it and then use it for pass-through? Who actually needs to be able to make international or long-distance calls? Who needs dial-through? I can guarantee you that 90% in any company, unless you're only sales, have no legitimate reason for dialing into your PBX and dialing out for long-distance receptionists, secretaries, people like that almost never need it. Sales guys, yeah, you can whitelist one or two of them, okay, whatever the list. But the more you limit it, the more you look at the rules and think about it, the less chance you have of having these things hit you at that $400,000 mark. Small question. I guess most of you guys are using IP phones, right? How many are using IP phones? Yay, good. How many of you are using the, any of the following? Snome, Astra, Polycoms, Cisco's, nice bunch. How about Grandstream, Yealink? Okay, how many of you have not set a password for the web GUI on any of those? One. Please go to the corner. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Why do you set up a password on all your web interfaces on these phones? What? So you can forget That's one good good answer, but come on, why do you do that? Wrong. Because you can initiate calls. That's one. Yes, okay, just to repeat that. You can initiate calls if you have the right uh, credentials through the password there. That's part of it. Yeah. Snome phones. There's this small URL you can just <coughs> activate on it, and it will initiate its own phone call. That's one. Yeah, you can also use it as a packet capture device, which is... That, <laughs> that's number two. And the worst, it is an eavesdropping device. Most of these phones have the ability to activate them from remote to listen to what's going on inside the room. Not it's just what's on the phone call like you would with a customer service rep, but yeah. actually... Microphone, listen and to everything. And most of these phones will not even say anything on the phone that it's currently in that mode. Well, I was actually called into a company a few months ago to do a survey and see if that mm -hmm. is possible to do on their phones. Amazingly enough, each and every phone was completely non-configured with any kind of password because the administrator said, well, I'm behind a firewall. Nobody can get to any of these addresses anyway. And I go, yeah, but if someone hacks your PBX or anything else on your network and wants that information, he'll get it. He goes, uh, problem. Big one. Now imagine this on any publicly traded company or bank or securities uh, involved group. And imagine how quickly the feds will come down on your ass if they find out that people are now listening and doing insider trading just because they were able to listen to your CEO or a customer's uh, every conversation. This isn't James Bond anymore, okay? They used to make a big to-do about being able to take a Nokia phone and doing certain things so you can use it to record and uh, transmit like Bond did in one of the movies. You don't need that anymore. It's already sitting on the desk. Can you share that URL to do that? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the one for Snome is available on the Snome Wiki. You can look it up. Uh, the one for Polycom is available from the SIP version 3.2 firmware. It's also in the documentation. It is regarded as activating call recording facilities, as far as I can recall. Yeah. Uh, one for Cisco, I don't recall. Uh, Yealink, I don't recall. But these two I remember because I tested these two specifically. In the case of the Polycom, is it specifically the models that have the on-phone call recording, or is it across the range? No, 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 no. Oh, Anything with a speakerphone. SIP 3.2 will have it. 
Most if you have phones a, will have it. If you have a speakerphone, you have it. <laughs> yeah. The, it, it, it's a feature, you know, it's there. It, it's there for our usage because we do need that kind of feature inside sometimes. a conference room and we want to be able to record the conference or whatever is going on in there. And most of the time, they gave the ability to do it from remote for a URL saying, you know, it's inside a secure network, blah, blah, blah. Whoever needs access to it has to do it through a service. And at the end of the day, it can be exploited if the network administrator is um, lazy or stupid, take your pick. Think oh. about it. This is a feature you want in a call center where customer service reps are, are occasionally monitored by management. You want to be able to do this. You just don't want to do it on the default password. Right. More cases. Anybody. Come on. We've got 50 people here. I'm sure we can get at least 30 stories. Yeah, we've got yes. another 20 minutes. I have a little one. A little one. Uh, one of my favorite... You know something? Hold on. Right. Let the other one. Okay. The other one. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I had a... I had a client that I just managed their IT, or I mean their, their phone system, they had another service that came in and did their IT. Well, evidently at some point in time, uh, I had worked with their original IT people to lock down the firewall so that um, only certain IP addresses could access their web GUI, which is basically my home address, mm -hmm. my IP address. At some point they transitioned to a new IT company who just blew away all the configs and reset they basically opened up the nice. phone server to the, the to the world. The world with no firewall. <laughs> and, uh, okay. And they started. They yeah. One day they called me and said, "Hey, we can't make any calls. AT and T is calling us, calling us. We've, we've got fraud alerts on our account. Can you tell us what's going on?" So I log in and I'm I'm looking around and I can't find anything on the phone server except there's one new extension to find on the free PBX. Only one. Yeah, there's one new. There's you only need one. One, you know, or extension 11, something like that. Okay. I was like, I, did, I didn't define that, so I deleted that, and uh, some, like, I don't know, it was late, so the next morning I came back, it's, it's back. <laughs> I'm like, okay, now something's going on. So I started looking through the web logs and everything. There was a, there's a specific URL you can go to on a Trixbox machine if it's open, yeah. and it'll prompt you for a, a password, but it, uh, it's one that there's there's like three default passwords on a free PBX install right. that comes through Churchbox that I never knew knew about, and so they were still set for that. Um, I wasn't the original installer of the system, but I should have known when I took it over. Hey, go check. To it. check okay, this. what were the damages? Uh, it was uh, <coughs> it was shut down within a few hours apparently, so I guess it wasn't. I don't, you don't know the exact number. Yeah, I don't know the exact number. I don't think it was very expensive because the customer was not very mad. A few and, hours can easily hit tens of thousands yeah. of dollars, though. Depending yeah. on the destination. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, yeah, I know it can be, but I don't think, however it worked out, they didn't get mad over the situation, the, the client. So, at least not with you. Well, yeah, at least not did, with me. Did you explain to them where the original uh, problem was as far as the firewall change? Yeah. Then those people probably got. Um, well, they might have. <laughs> but, uh, we'll okay. There you go. Oop. Whoops. Almost. Okay. More. Yes. I, I got a, a some customers up in Canada, and uh, you know we pre-provisioned their phones and shipped them out to them for a hosted solution. Okay. And uh, for some reason, this guy has kind of a long. Okay. Problem. Can you come closer to the mic? Yeah. I don't think they're going to be able to get this one on the video, the audio part of it. Yeah, unfortunately, we don't have a hand. Well, actually, you could walk over and let him talk to yeah. you. Oh, oh. Wait, wait. Um, okay. We, we want to have everybody hear you. Yeah, we want everybody you don't have to be, to hear you. Then we, you don't back. have to be on film. But Here we go. All right. So uh, at any rate, we have, a, we have some cl clients up in Canada that use a hosted solution, and we shipped them some phones. And we pre-provision them. We changed the passwords and, and the whole bit. Um, this guy was having trouble, so we supplied him with the changed password. Um, he fiddly farted around with it for a while and decided he was going to reset it. He reset it back to the default password. <laughs> his network wasn't set up correctly and he had a, his phone registered with an outside IP address. It was probably all of about 10 minutes, I reckon, before it got hacked and, and somebody took his credentials and started making calls. Um, since I was kind of watching the situation anyways, it was pretty limited, I think about $292 worth of damages. Um, but. That was my one fraud case. Uh, but th so. that just goes to show, 10 minutes from you're out there to you're targeted. 
Yeah, it didn't take long at all. I mean, somebody was obviously doing some port scanning and whatnot. And oh, that, that's a good question. Um, here. Here's Whoops. Sorry, here we go. Um, Sorry, trying not to get you in the head. Yeah. Oh. Here's an interesting question, trivia question. If you take a Linux box or a server, it doesn't really matter, and, and your password is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, most distributions, old distributions will accept that. How long will it take from the minute you put it on a public IP address till it's hacked? Found and hacked. No, it takes a bit more. Six to twelve minutes. Somebody said seven minutes, right? You said seven minutes. Who said seven minutes? Hand it. Seven minutes. So you're saying six, six to twelve, seven. What else? It's based on the number of consecutive digits that you, uh, right? Because if it's a random, some sort of generator predicting your password, then the longer your number of bits. Well, but I mean, you also got to factor in the amount of time it's going to take for somebody to notice that there's a new machine up. Well, you just heard 10 minutes for one guy. Okay, so the answer is, the answer is, depends on one country your server is located at. For example, if you're in Israel, that server will get hijacked in less than 3.5 minutes. <laughs> 3.5 minutes, goes online, hijacked. It's a fact. I've done the test myself 20 times. I initiated 20 virtual machines, each one with one, two, three, four, five, six, and wanted to see how much time it will take for all machines to get hacked. It take all machines were hacked in less than five minutes. Uh, I would rather not disclose at this point. You can ask me later on. You're more than welcome. I'm not, you know. Um, sorry. No, they weren't. They weren't, they weren't consecutive. <laughs> they weren't consecutive. It's re uh, really funny. In the United States, true, it's anything between 6 to 12 minutes. Uh, in the UK, I believe it's around 7 to 8, more or less. It depends on uh, who is your hosting facility. If you're hosting at... Uh, okay, I'll, not, I, I, I'll shut up at this point. <laughs> don't, don't give no, too many No, I won't go stories. there. No, no, no. You can ask me later. <laughs> um, okay. So what have we learned here? That again, most of the problems are located somewhere in between the administrator and the user. Remember, your users are the weakest point in the chain of this telephony system, of this new hybrid of telephony and IT. Can you even imagine using something like, let's say, Microsoft OCS that has everything on it? Oh, let's drop our file server on it and our mail server. And you know something? Also, the CRM and ERP are there because and we like to use whatever Microsoft gives us. And we'll drop also the, the actual PBX in there. And one of those gets hacked. Beautiful. I just love the idea of what will happen at that point. You're, not, you're no longer only stealing phone calls. You're stealing a whole company. Credit cards, phone numbers, credit history, the whole bit. The whole bit. Whole nine yards are available to you. You're nodding. <coughs> you, you, I'm just thinking that's, that's terrible. Ah, okay. <laughs> You're just really, oh, Think damn. about it. You, your average call center has firewalls in all of the servers, and the PBX is directly connected <coughs> to the database. It has customer name, <coughs> transaction history, credit card information, bank transfer information. All of this suddenly is now available. So between phishing attacks and brute force through the, fire, uh, the PBX, you could be exposed if you're not actually watching what's going on. That's, yeah. That's just reminding me. Um, there's an um, interesting experience I had with IPv6. Now, Ooh, <laughs> juicy, up. So, so <laughs> it's, 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 not a, it's not a telecom fraud. There's no fraud involved. It's just an unpleasant surprise. Um, so I, I was doing some testing for a customer of mine who who wanted to verify that a library we'd written worked on IPv6. So I built a raw IPv6 network. Um, and I found to my surprise that all of these devices that I put on this network automatically found their own routes. And so the instant that I made a tunnel to one of them, they were all routable. 
So you, you, you have your, your IT guy who's just experimenting with a little bit of IPv6 to find out what's going on, and bam, unless you're careful, your whole network is now publicly routable, including all your phones, which may support IPv6 nat natively. It's worse. And this is where we were talking MAC addresses. Yeah. OK. Ah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Here's something interesting about okay, IPv6. Who, who's familiar with IPv6? Just the, oh, uh -oh. Tim, come Sorry. on. I, I just want to follow this up. I said that I gave this story to some, uh, a while back, and the guy behind me said, stop spreading fear and uncertainty about IPv6. It's good. <laughs> now, it is. There are a lot of good stuff about it. It's just you have to know. It's a new thing. You have to know what you're doing, and you have to be aware. Go read the books before you start using it. Keep Sorry. in mind the standards still being written for IPv6. Yeah. So they keep changing things, and what was valid a year ago is not valid today, NAT being one of those. Originally, they wrote NAT in, then we wrote NAT out, now they're trying to write it back in. Here's an interesting fact about IPv6. How many of you are aware and familiar with IPv6 at a usage level, at some level, IPv6 theory? Okay, so according to IPv6, there is no such thing as non-routable addresses. Okay, what is your basic IP address on an IPv6 network? The MAC address of your network card. Wonderful. Let's make life for hackers Easy. simpler. Because now, if I want to target 3COM-based PBX, no, these no longer okay, exist. Wait, wait, wait. wait, wait. Uh, You're going too fast. Understand, MAC address is assigned by manufacturer. It is unique to manufacturer. So therefore, you put out, and it, when you were saying the three com, but it's no longer the case, you have one MAC address for a particular card for a particular server that's pre-done, okay? Now you can go searching for that particular address and do a scan for that before you attack it, and you know who you're hitting. Or the worst case is, let's say you're Cisco, and you come up with Cisco Call Manager Express version 26, which is support and connected, supports IPv6, and is connected through an IPv6 network, and you'll just take that series of, you know, the four or six initial uh, digits of your MAC address, then, you know, the series for that specific version is two more hexadecimal digits, so I'm gonna target that, because there is a, an exploit exactly for that to get into this PBX system. How wonderful. Instead of going about and scouting the entire internet, I'm now scouting a very small and precise environment, yes? Yes, but you know you know the la the rightmost digits. So now all you have to do is go and check the leftmost, and you've got your problem half solved. You're no longer random for all hundred and twenty-eight. You're, no yeah. you're only random for the leftmost sixty-four. You're no okay, longer so you're back to IPv4 exactly. level hacking because the rightmost is already fixed or relatively fixed. You're assuming that people are going to auto auto config servers. Well, we That's because remember. people don't necessarily know how not to, yeah. or don't bother to. Okay, it's here's people. Okay, how many people remember when one guy in on the Eastern Seaboard decided to test NT and proceeded to take out the entire Eastern Seaboard for his company, or somebody went and installed a Cisco router update uh, at WorldCom? This was ten years ago, and took out the entire WorldCom internet because it present did, did six days of router table updates. Nothing but router table updates. Two weeks later, AT&T pulled the same stunt after claiming that world, it can't happen to us, only WorldCom is that stupid. Okay? <laughs> it was a Stratacom switch for the AT&T one. Um, unfortunately, tech guys make mistakes. Tech guys are always, um, I admit it, okay? We're all tech guys, programmers, architects, designers. We, there is one thing which is very much common to all of us. You know what that is? We're what? No. Yeah. Well, that well, too. That too. <laughs> well, actually, no. we hope so. <laughs> uh, uh, well, well, I know a few IT guys who are barely human, but that's something completely different. What? Yeah, overworked. Lack of sleep. Lack of sleep makes us go what? No, we don't go. So we go lazy. You know that every Linux distribution that you go about and install has an IPv6 auto configured on it? It's there, you never turn it off. There's your answer. 
you're doing it yourself and you're not even realizing you're, you same applies for windows install windows 7 this windows server vista whatever you want ipv6 is in there and at least theoretically voice over ip is in there as well so the end result is that no matter what we'll do we'll always be confronted with some form of fraud and some form of uh I won't say back door, but some vulnerability that's in there, and we don't really know about it. Sometimes even the manufacturer doesn't know about it. You won't know about it till it gets exploited out in the wild. Uh, we had a no, case... Reported. Reported in the wild, okay. yes. That, that's um, the big to-do, because people don't like admitting this publicly. The fact yeah. that we've gotten people saying, yes, we've been, I've been defrauded, uh, is a big thing, because a lot of companies, a lot of people are afraid to admit that. Yeah. How, how many of you are familiar with the uh, asterisk cross-site scripting CDR vulnerability. Yes, good, one. We've got a crowd of 50 professionals and only one is familiar with it. Now, the reason you're familiar with it because you, A, most probably read the advisory, right? And number two, up until about three, four weeks ago, it hadn't been known in the wild to exist. There wasn't an exploit. Now, about four weeks ago at Humbug, right? <laughs> yeah. That was a very interesting Thursday. Thursday oh. in Israel is the last day of the week. We don't work Fridays, we don't work Saturdays. So Thursday is always, always this week where everybody's just a bit, you know, just a bit woozy. We're done over the week. And suddenly one of the collectors on the Humbug platform, a specific one, just died. And it kept on dying. And we had no idea why. So one of the programmers that's in charge of that specific collector went in and start looking at it and say, hey, take a look at this thing. And inside the, the from header was a backtick, wget, http, da -da 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 -da. Oh, what is that? So we were like starting to investigate. Initially, we were uh, under the impression that somebody is trying to actually um, utilize the dial parties and free PBX. But then we realized that the context that we're seeing as part of the CDRs, as part of the events, are not your standard free PBX contexts. So it was something different. I ended up spending roughly 27 hours over the weekend building virtual machines and trying to ascertain exactly what's going on and found and actually realized that it's that specific exploit. Somebody is trying to take advantage of that specific cross-site scripting because it exists in very old version of versions of asterisk. It's exploitable. Now, there were no reports of this in the wild out there that somebody's doing it, but here we found it, and we found it at three different customers of Humbug. The same it, the day. The same day. So there is some kind of botnet out there trying to scan and see where it goes, which was really interesting. Um, another thing in regards to that is that that's the essence and the idea behind Humbug, because the minute we find something on one end of the network, on one of the nodes, we're able to now recognize it for everybody. So it becomes automatically available to everybody and everybody will get an alert specific to that. So it's pretty easy for us to do. Now, besides the humbug marketing shtick at this point, but again, if most companies, as Eric said, won't admit to have been defrauded. I know of a case in Israel, a company that was pre-IPO, pre-IPO, they were defrauded for $140,000 worth of traffic, which went unreported. They actually cleared it with the ISP, with them. Yeah, we won't pay that much, we blah, 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 just in order to quiet it down because they were pre-IPO. These cases tend to get quieted down. But eventually, the people who suffer are not the managers. They're not the CEO of the company who, well, okay, boom, another $50,000, whoop de doo It's our, we, we suffer. Because at the end of the day, the ball comes down to us, and we have to answer to these people and say, okay, it happened. Why did it happen? Oh, you fell asleep on your job. This is what happens. Taking this one step further, how many of you uh, heard about what the SEC did last week as far as the new reporting rules? They announced that every publicly traded company in the United States or registered in the U.S. has to report cybercrime. Anytime you are hacked as a 
and somebody breaches your internet, you now have to report it publicly to the SEC because this is a fiscal responsibility factor. How much you want to bet within two years they're going to hit telecom fraud and, and make you declare that too? How many are familiar with the EU regulation regarding finance institutes? You're probably familiar with that. Yeah, One? 14th of November. Exactly. Starting 14th of November this year, every financial institute in the EU has to record every phone call that is made out of any financial institute phone call system, that be landline or mobile. That's amazing. Yeah, to be precise, it's UK only and it's voice, SMS, uh, mess and, and data. data. I know that they're now trying to push it into the EU. It's the full EU. UK. Yeah. So, uh, people, the l various legislations, the various uh, authorities are now realizing that both cybercrime and telephony fraud and fraud in general is now becoming a huge problem for everybody. This is no longer the uh, Fortune 500 only problem. <coughs> this is now a problem for everybody. Bearing from mom and pop's jeans shop located in Idaho, God knows where, and up to a Fortune 100 or a Fortune 50 company. Think about it. A couple of years ago, people did not have PBXs for businesses of four or five people. They had a Centrex, they had four or five DIDs, they had one phone with a bunch of extensions. Now suddenly you guys have voice over IP switches. Asterix, Digium, all of these things are a wonderful thing, but now suddenly it's no longer corporations in the Fortune 1000 who have them. Now you're down to little stores, uh, accountants, people who have six people working for them or less. Makes a hell of a lot more targets for people to hit. And the more it becomes prevalent, just like it was when Windows came out, the more there are, the more people you're going to have who are going to start hitting it because there's money in it. So you guys are going to get hit with the, how do I make myself secure, or I've been defrauded, what did you do wrong? And they will start asking questions. Because if you're responsible for the phone switch, obviously you screwed up. The CEO is not the one who did it. So. Well, we're more or less out, we're of, out time. of time. Yeah. Last thing Last, I want to throw out. Yeah. Still giving away the cards and the um, white papers if anybody wants them to try this stuff. Uh, proactive analytics detection, and we're going to be doing prevention, prevention. shortly uh, against the known fraud. And whoever wants sweets, we still have some. So yes, who wants to grab them? Here we go. Okay, I um, need to have lunch. My aim's getting worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs>